Hello, you guys, and welcome to We're Pod This Together. It's a podcast where we guide you through our favorite or not so favorite Disney Channel original movies. I'm Indoni. I'm Lori, and today we're joined by Faith Hill and Practical Magic super fan Luke. That's me. Ho, ho, ho. Now we've got a Christmas podcast. We're starting off our holiday extravaganza with Die Hard. In this movie, John McClane, officer of the NYPD, tries to save his wife Holly Gennaro and several others that were taken hostage hostage by German terrorist Hans Gruber during a Christmas party at the Nakatomi Plaza in Los Angeles. Have you guys seen this before? Yeah, I saw it for the first time in college. I've seen it a few times, but before yesterday, I hadn't seen it for probably five or six years. I think I only saw it like two years ago, but I've watched it a couple of times since then because it's really cool. It's a pretty dope movie. And I know there's like a lot of contention as to whether or not it's actually a Christmas movie, but I just use it kind of being almost a Christmas movie as an excuse to watch it. I think that if at the end of the movie it had snowed, that would solidify it unquestionably as a Christmas movie. It would have been it would have been a, a, an unquestionable Christmas movie. It always snows at the end of Christmas movies. Yeah, there should have been a montage of Bruce Willis with his kids in the film, like sledding or something <laughs> like that, doing snow angels. Except it's just sand because they're in LA. Just sledding down past the Hollywood sign. Or like Argyle's throwing fake snow at them as they sled. I loved Argyle. He was the most unnecessary best character in a movie ever. <laughs> he were, like he, They could have utilized him so much more, but... They didn't at all. He was just a nice little comic relief every once in a while, but kind of unnecessary because Bruce Willis gave plenty of comic relief. What I thought was weird about this was I was looking at Bruce Willis's movie history before this movie because this is like a really big budget one. And it turns out it's like his first actual starring theatrical thing. And so I looked into why they would give a no name a role in this like giant action movie and kind of like one of the golden ages of action movies. And I found the list of people that turned down this role. And it is Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Richard Gere, and Burt Reynolds all had to turn it down for Bruce Willis to be offered this movie. I am so glad Richard Gere turned this down. Can you yeah. imagine? And it wouldn't really work with Arnold Schwarzenegger against German terrorists with his Austrian accent. I mean, they could have some hostility. I mean, maybe, but it would be ridiculous. <laughs> so this movie starts with John on a plane. And the first, like, I'd say 10 or so minutes of this movie are focused on setting up the relationship between John and his wife and kind of making us wonder if they're still a thing or not, which was a weird choice for, like, this action movie to focus so much on this marriage. Just a lot for the first few minutes. I didn't hate it. It was just weird. Well, they kind of make him seem like he's a a womanizer, I guess. I don't know, because he like keeps on checking out basically every woman he walks by. I also think it's important to note that while he's on the plane, some jerk sitting next to him tells him to take off his shoes after the flight and make fists with his toes. That jerk was trying to be helpful. <laughs> he was, <laughs> but such weird advice. If I if like that were told to a woman, it'd be the creepiest thing because it just sounds like an excuse. Like this guy just wanted to see Bruce Willis's feet, right? No, he was trying to tell like <laughs> trying to give him advice on how to make flying easier. I wonder if Andoni is excusing it so much because anytime he's sitting next to a stranger on an airplane, this is what he does. You got me. I'm so into airplane feet. <laughs> just airplane feet. <laughs> There's something about that elevation that really... Really just really does it for me. That and wiggly toes. Dirty, dirty airplane carpet. That's definitely never been washed. There is a lot of Bruce Willis feet in this movie. It's almost like Tarantino-y. Yeah, I could see that. Is it a surprise that Tarantino cast him in Pulp Fiction after this film? (laughs) (laughs) No. (laughs) And we don't get any of his feet in that. None. Well, you see his dick. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't notice that somehow. <laughs> I didn't notice that either. Well, that is but I believe that he's it. naked, so you probably see his feet at that point, too. And so you find out that the Nakatomi, it's the name of the building, but then it's also the name of the company and the man who owns it, I guess. They just kind of come up with their one Japanese word and use it kind of interchangeably with everything. There's a business holiday party going on and there's a quintessential 80s cocaine business boy hitting on a woman who we later find out is John's wife, Holly. The best guy. Good guy. Nice guy. But she's the head honcho, which is impressive. 
we find out pretty quickly that she got a job offer in LA and had to move away from John in New York. And it's the whole, was she right for leaving and stuff, but she got a really high up position and an apparently really important company versus him being a police officer in New York. He's not a detective or like higher ranking than just being an officer is the impression I got. So I don't see, I guess people who live in New York tend to really love New York and stuff, but he could easily just go and become part of LAPD. Yeah. And Argyle really puts that under the microscope too. He's kind of like, yeah, John, I can see through you. You decided to stay in New York because you thought that Holly would fail. But clearly that didn't happen. She's doing great. Yeah, which is also real shitty of him. I mean, obviously there was probably some marital issues before that, but clearly by not going with her, that was a huge issue. And how could you not see that that would be an issue? Well, especially since there's kids involved. But also like you're just going to let her go to L.A. with your kids and then you're kind of he was almost like hoping that she would fail. And then you can just leave your kids and her there with her failing a single income and you can just move, just move and get a job there. They don't make it explicit right away because, but then they like show there's a picture that's in her desk. And as she's sitting there, her housekeeper, nanny or whatever calls. And she says that if John shows up, she has a spare room for him. And then right after she said that, she like pushes the family photo down. So we really know that they're, I think at this point too, they probably show the door and she's going by her maiden name. So in her head, she's already divorced and she's like, screw that guy. He thought I would fail. But then later on, she's like, I missed you, which I guess is not two mutually exclusive emotions, but it muddies the waters. Is she, Luke, have you seen the, you've seen sequels maybe? Yeah, I think I've seen all of them. Is she, do they keep dying harder together? Uh, They're still on the rocks and die hard too. And it's kind of a similar situation where at the end, they're sort of better. I mean, doesn't she die real hard in one of the movies? Shit. I I don't think she, maybe she does and I'm forgetting it, but she either dies real hard or they like end up officially divorced. (laughs) By Die Hard 4, she's out of the picture totally. I might be thinking of another Bruce Willis movie, one that's more recent, where his wife and daughter both die. Are you thinking of The Sixth Sense where he's dead? Are you thinking of the reboot of Walking Tall or something? I might be thinking of oh, Death the Element where he's already divorced. I feel like any Bruce Willis character, though, is kind of energy- six cents aside. And like, keep in mind, I've seen like four Bruce Willis movies ever. But I feel like all of his characters are kind of interchangeable. Like retired cop, retired military guy. And just kind of like... Fumbling into an action situation. Oh no, gotta use all these muscles. Yeah. We meet Argyle, who we've already kind of talked about. He's a limo driver, but he used to be a cab driver, so he's super duper chatty. And there's a moment where he turns on Christmas and Hollis by Run DMC, and Bruce Willis gets mad that it's not Christmas music, and he's like, it is Christmas music. And Bruce Willis seems surprised, which is pretty common with people interacting with rap music, because of course it just has to be gross, I guess, and can't possibly be about Christmas. I was also like very surprised at how relaxed and go with the flow he was about just a limo driver staying in the airport with his name on a sign. A limo driver that he didn't call or schedule and that he wasn't expecting. He's just like, hey, that's my name. And then he just has this interaction with the limo driver. And he just gets in there like, what the fuck are you doing? Wait, did the sign say his first and last name? Because his name is John. So he could have just stolen somebody else's car. Uh, I think it said like J.M. Like... That could be so many people. How many McLeans do you know? 12. You're lying. All of their first names are John. The only McLean that I know is that YouTube makeup artist whose first name might be John. Probably is. That's by law the only first name aside from Holly. Both of Bruce's children in this movie are named John. John and or Holly. Holly John, John Holly. It's like what Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith did with their kids. Oh. So it's Jono and... I forgot the other one's name and I'm tired of this joke. It's Jana and Hollow. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Oh, wait. Can we also talk about the fact that he was on the airplane and he's got a fucking gun with him? This was pre-9-11, my dude. But just because you're a cop doesn't mean you get to take a gun with you on a plane. In the 80s, you could have for sure. Yeah? I bet so. Damn. I mean, I'm sure you yes. you know from all your experience of flying <laughs> in the 80s. I was going to say, as somebody who's never been a cop, owned a gun, or been on a plane in the 80s, got it. But I think that was a thing. It was like you used to be able to like, smoke and shit in airplanes, no problem. Oh, yeah, and he was smoking in the airport. 
And in Argyle's car, that bothered me. Yeah, but in the 80s, like, you were, everybody was smoking everywhere. Do you guys remember when you would go to a restaurant with your family and they would ask smoking or non-smoking? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was weird. And sometimes I still wish that they asked that just so I could be like, non-smoking, please. Just to feel above everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> you just so that, can you imagine the airplanes would like smell so bad because they don't get air? It's insane that they just had like ashtrays built into the Ugh. armrests. Yeah, they lingered for a while because they wouldn't just switch out the whole plane. But... <laughs> I gotta get rid of this one. <laughs> oh man, I told them because they were metal. I always used to fucking just play around, like slapping it open and close. Because <laughs> I was a really ADHD heavy kid, so I just had to make a lot of noise. I bet you were the everybody's favorite on the airplane. <laughs> I was actually quite well behaved on airplanes. Of the one time, I lost like thirty. Hot Wheels cars on an airplane. <laughs> what? Oh, no. I, my dad always tells this story. They had bought me this box of toys of Hot Wheel cars, like in the airport before we got on the plane. I was playing around with them, and I would like drop one, and then it would fall on the ground, and it would just go rolling back under the seat. <laughs> so I lost like a whole shitload of them. I just imagine there's some kid at the back of the bus thinking magic is actually real. Oh, I want my fucking Hot Wheels back. John gets to his wife's office and Coke Boy is in there doing lines off of her desk, even though like she's made it very clear, not explicitly, but it's clear that she's not interested and like doesn't even enjoy his presence and he feels comfortable enough just doing Coke lines off her desk. I mean, it was the closest office to the party, so got to get that fix. But do you? Never mind. Um, I, don't gonna... <laughs> I don't know about Coke. I was going to ask, like, do you? Just never mind. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, go ahead. Ask me. I'm a fountain of information when it comes to hard drugs. Well, because like I feel like you don't need to do the lines. You could probably just just get some on your hand or something. It seemed like an unnecessary step to show like ownership over her office and his intentions to like be intimate with her. Yeah, you can just do a bump. Okay, apparently I do know. Something <laughs> it was a weird power move though because. As far as I could tell, she's higher up than this guy in the company, but he was talking about her as if he was her superior in some ways. He was talking about like getting her a watch and stuff. And yeah, apparently he had a private bathroom and she didn't. I guess it was the 80s. And she's like, this was when women were really, I think in the 80s, women in like business positions, it went up something like 76%. And that's why women's fashion at that point was so menswear and like shoulder pads and stuff because they had to kind of try to masculinize themselves to fit into the office space. Yeah, those uh, those silhouettes really carried over into the 90s, or at least for my mom, they did. She <laughs> not, did not want to update her wardrobe that often. So I remember those shoulder pads lasted for a long time into my life. That's fan. I remember cutting them out of clothes in the 90s. She cut them out, but the shape was still kind of there in like her blazers and her dresses and stuff. I was not wearing many blazers as a child, I'll admit. <laughs> <laughs> You're alone in that regard. I wore blazers nonstop. But yeah, so she's gone faxy. I feel like at some point we were supposed to think that this guy was trying to get with her and that John was maybe supposed to be jealous. And it just seemed like him and his wife just did not give a shit about this guy. Aside from being like mildly annoyed. Yeah, but they, they both recognized that this guy was trying to hit on her. Yeah. But neither but... of them seemed the least bit threatened. Yeah, which was just, I love that they put this in this movie without it having any payoff at all, except for him eventually dying, I guess. But like, there was well, many They wanted times... to establish that he was a garbage person. Yeah, we've already had him hitting on the wife and then talking about the wife as if he knew her intimately to like who he probably knows as her husband and doing cocaine on her desk. So like, all 12 words we, he looks he looks like every 80s villain guy ever it's like a time capsule of the corruption that i feel like was running rampant in the 80s and early 90s like you hear about how how dangerous and trashy new york city was and then you have all these really horrible people it's all this it's like vice there you go vice you know everyone's getting rich quick and there's all these substances available for them to 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 abuse and everyone's garbage there's so many garbage people in this movie if anything i think her role in this movie was pretty progressive especially if coming from i think it'd be progressive in today's standards like how she and him interacted and stuff and how she interacted with like john she's just like well fuck you i'm gonna go off and get my own job and how she interacted with the terrorists too yeah 
like she did she was kind of a damsel at one point but even while she was being held hostage by hans like she was kind of like whatever i'm not scared of like go fuck yourself (laughs) yeah (laughs) there were like two different very blonde terrorists and then the notes i took i couldn't really tell them apart one was more mullety mullety than the other one but they were both like very aryan and very muscular they were brothers right yeah, I think okay. one of them had short hair, actually. Yeah, one had, like, it wasn't a mullet, but it was mullet adjacent enough that it's all I could think about. Yeah, they, this was, this movie was full of Aryan specimens. <laughs> <laughs> um, and really, oh, God, the sweaters were so good. I don't know why, but all the terrorists had on these sweaters. They were all muscular, and they were very well-cut sweaters. They were very clean-cut thieves. Yeah. And they were all so well-spoken and had such good personalities. I don't know any of their names, but there was the one man who was, like, wearing the glasses and who was kind of in charge of all the tech stuff. He was, like, doing this weird ongoing commentary of stuff that was happening. Oh, my God. He was so obnoxious, but... I loved him. You are also wearing glasses. (laughs) The Aryan twins. And then there was, like, the cowboy man who took over at the front desk. I kind of assumed that his accent was fake when he did the cowboy voice, but he didn't speak any other time. It could have been. What if he was, like, just really into the role? Where before he did like method acting before they actually did this. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of another German name. God damn it, Friedrich, stop with that stupid Western voice. That was like weirdly good. Thank you. I have the IMDb page up and I'm looking at the actual actors' names. There is a ha- there's a Hans Beringer. Uh, Wilhelm von Homburg. Wilhelm. Oh, that's such a good name. So they could have just used their real name. I mean, (laughs) aside from Alan Rickman, are they all like actually German? Maybe. Yeah. Wilhelm as himself. (laughs) (laughs) They just got some German terrorists. He didn't know they were act. They weren't robbing an actual building. (laughs) Six hundred million dollars. That. That. I mean. That's a good way to trick anyone. So yeah, the terrorists finally show up in like a. In a moving truck or something. Yeah. The picture, once they finally open the back of that truck is like, I picture the lead up to that, them <laughs> whipping around those corners and then Alan Rickman just slamming against the sides of the fucking truck <laughs> in the back with everyone else. No, I imagine him standing gracefully while everybody else is like flying around behind them. And he just kind of like casually like ducks when one of them's about to go over him. Yeah. When they arrive though, they shoot. The, the mullet one is like, he gets there first. I think they were maybe in a different vehicle or something because there's like a couple that show up they kill the front desk man and then there's a random old man at the elevator and they also just kill him and then that's when yeah the the truck shows up and like alan rickman has a very it reminded me a lot of the dark knight it's been so long since i've seen the dark knight or any of the recent batman movies i was wondering while watching this stuff like that that i've noticed in other movies that happened after this if it's just i haven't watched many action movies earlier than this one probably so i don't know if this one kind of set the stage for action movies from the 90s and 2000s and stuff or if it's just how action movies are when i when i was looking up stuff for the movie earlier when i was watching at work there was a i think it was a buzzfeed article it was like 10 movies that have totally ripped off die hard and one of them <laughs> was that movie with die the hard rock. two die hard three <laughs> keep on dying harder <laughs> we just won't die just called skyscraper <laughs> yeah that's the one with uh the rock right like the yeah. cover art looks exactly the same whereas they're like it's the skyscraper that's on fire and it's half of the rock's face and he's looking very shocked. And that's what it is with this one, just with Bruce Willis. I kind of really want to see that movie though. I mean, if you like this movie, you'll probably like that one. And I like the rock more than I like Bruce Willis. So I'm undecided about that. That's wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's very dramatic when they come in, they immediately cut the phone lines. Hans keeps talking in German half. I think like half the terrorists are German and the other half aren't. So he's talking German on and off and it's very dramatic and amazing. And I'll I wonder what they're actually saying in German. I cannot speak German. What do you think they're saying? Maybe we can get into that. <laughs> I think I always think it'd be really funny in movies like this where they're just kind of saying random if it was just something funny that was still made sense. So if people who actually spoke German were watching it, they're like, why did he just ask him to go grab him some McDonald's or something like that? I just picture that they're complimenting each other's hair and sweaters. (laughs) Wilhelm, your hair looks so good and flowing today. (laughs) I just really liked how good they were at their jobs. Yeah. Like they had all these scenes where these bad guys were doing things really quickly and efficiently. And for some reason, I found that super satisfying. 
it seems like they all had a very specific job. Like it wasn't just like do whatever you can do while you're close to the thing. Like whoever gets there first, it was like, well, you're going to go here, you're going to go here. And then the blonde boys are just going to kind of wander and shoot things. Yeah. Although the brothers, I think it was the brothers. They were like fucking around at one point. Cause the one who was cutting the phone line or like connecting the phone line that they needed, the one with the long hair came and just took a fucking chainsaw and cut all the lines at once before he could even finish. So he was like fucking around with his brother. He's like, I'm going to mess you up, bud. I think they were just the muscle. The bads end up shooting the party up and they make it clear that everybody at the party is just hostages now. Do actual office parties happen at the offices? I feel like you're supposed to go somewhere. No, I feel like that's a movie misrepresentation. The same thing with high school reunions. Like they don't take place at the high school because you can't have booze at a high school. But anyway, they're having it at the place. Bruce is off by himself for some reason at this point. Yeah, I don't know that coming back just in time for your wife's Christmas party is the best time to reunite after a tumultuous like separation. But she invited him, though. It seems bad. Say, I'll be at the house. I'm gonna hang out with the kids. And when you're done with the Christmas party, we can talk. Yeah, maybe that was his initial plan, though. And Holly's boss sent the limo for John. So Okay. He's also not dressed well for an office Christmas party. And he's not wearing shoes. Oh, because is he put on his shoes after the airplane. But why does he take them off again? He never took his shoes off on the airplane. I'm so When you, when you <laughs> also accused me of a foot fetish, I was trying to explain to you what the other business guy on the plane was saying. He was saying flying is easier or like it makes it better to take off your shoes and like grip the carpet with your feet whenever you get to where you're supposed to be going. Oh, Doesn't make sense to me. I don't know that. how I just like did not understand any of that. I think you I was wanted just... me to admit my foot fetish. <laughs> Secret. So, <laughs> so in your mind, in your mind, he like left the airport barefoot, got in the car, I think <laughs> got so. all the way to the office. <laughs> Man, it was the 80s. It was a different time, man. No shirt, no shoes. Maybe serve it. (laughs) (laughs) Not not at Nakatomi Plaza. That place is classy. Well, he's still wearing like a tank top. Oh, he he wasn't wearing that on the airplane, though. I think he was wearing like... I can't imagine him wearing literally anything else. (laughs) I'm having a difficult time, too, because when we were talking about Pulp Fiction, I remembered... His co- his his outfit in that movie is very similar. Yeah. I.e. jeans and a tank top. He lives. That's his secret. And his dick oh. out, apparently. And his what? <laughs> his dick out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and white converse. I genuinely though, I think I was too excited about Hans Gruber's like one of the best villains ever. So I think I was just so like, when's he coming? He's here, and then just everything else disappeared. What is even happening at, at this point? point? They get. <laughs> Does Hans movie. Gruber have shoes on? <laughs> He does, and they're very stylish. I actually don't know, but I'm assuming he's very well dressed. Well, he makes a point to talk about his very fancy suit and Nakatomi's fancy suit when he takes him away somewhere else. And then he's also talking about Yasser Arafat also having the same suit. I'm like, bro, what? Yeah, and he also quotes Plutarch at one point. He's just the like most pretentious, best person. I love him. He's great. Like, as far as, like, thieving murderers go, I, I'd be friends with him. <laughs> you let him <laughs> shoot you? I mean, like, there are worse people that could shoot me. He has really good aim. Like, when Nakatomi, at this point, is held super hostage, because he was already hostage, but now he's, like, next <laughs> level in the office alone with Hans Gruber. He's extra hostage. <laughs> um, Nakatomi pickles, is pointing out that you guys keep trying to act like you're terrorists, but you're nothing but lowly thieves, which is true. That's when Han starts complimenting his suit. And he's like, oh, it'll be a shame for that to get ruined. And he does like a countdown and then shoots him in the head, which I think is meant to spare the suit. But there's a lot of splatter. Like you're, it's that suit's not ca- going to be okay. What do they do with his body? It just kind of disappears. But, hmm? I mean, there's he a lot of office- someone to, to deal with it, I think. Oh, you never see that happen. They didn't bring a rug cleaner with them. That's a mistake. If they're blowing up the building. They're not trying to save it. <laughs> it does a cut and it does this several times. Argyle, they keep showing him, even though it has nothing to do with anything. They keep showing him in the car. And it seems to me like he's just listening to the same like really long song every time. And he's like talking to some woman about how he's going to be able to meet up with her after he's done with this, which I think he ends up standing her up probably. Also, he has a giant stuffed bear with him. 
that was why what is that? John brought he, that he had that on the airplane with him. Oh, why would you only have one teddy bear if you have two kids? Shit, I didn't think about that. He loves one more. He definitely does, and it's the daughter because she's the only one that has lines. The son's like he has cancer, and they've already like mourned his death. <laughs> God, you made that dark so quick. The sun actually does come back in Die Hard 5. Spoiler alert, but... Oh, yeah. Isn't he the guy from Jeepers Creepers? I just know that he's not a very good actor, and it's a very bad Die Hard movie. Is he, like, 40? Father. <laughs> you forgot about me for so long. <laughs> he, Yeah, he's like a grown man, and they're in Chernobyl. But that's a different story, so... <laughs> Bruce is... Like, all the phone lines are cut, and... So he sets off a bunch of alarms to try to get, like, the cops and the fire people to the tower, and then he sees a bunch of them, and they're not actually going to the tower, so that doesn't work. And then blonde number two, who I think is the long-haired one, and Bruce fight, and then Bruce kills him and tries to take his shoes, but they're too small. Which is so disappointing. He was so (laughs) tall and muscular. Very small feet. That's how Bruce killed him so easily. He didn't have good balance. <laughs> uh, he really didn't. Also, I think the the blonde that he kills here is the short haired one. Okay. So I'm yeah, the one the one with the better sweater too. Hair length corresponds to age. So <laughs> long hair was definitely the older brother. His baby brother's dead, and that's why he's on a quest for vengeance throughout this whole movie. At one point, he steals his younger brother's hair and adds it to his own hair as a sign of honor. <laughs> that was my favorite scene yeah um at this point like they realize that there's a an unintended person trying to mess up their plans and hans a just rogue goes, element as they would say yeah that's what hans would call it because he's very well spoken yeah and so all of its team is maybe trying to get him to divert from the plan. He's like, no, we'll deal with it. It's just one guy. How bad could it be? And that's when the wife is like, all these people seem so upset and crazed. It has to be my husband doing this. <laughs> it's gotta be my piece of shit husband driving <laughs> crazy like he did me. And so Bruce, uh, he got a walkie talkie and guns from the blonde guy. Is yeah. that the one? I don't think I put it in the notes, but that's the one where he writes like, ho, 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 now I have a machine gun and sends him down the elevator. And yeah, that's yeah. how Hans and stuff realize that there's a rogue element. Yeah. In case you didn't get that, people, that's why we <laughs> intro the podcast with that. Oh, so he has a walkie-talkie and he's, since all the phone lines are cut, apparently walkie-talkies in this movie are just like very powerful. They're basically 80s cell phones, I guess. And he's able to call dispatch and they're really rude to him, even though there's clearly like gunshots and stuff happening. Yeah. I don't know how they can think that it's a prank or a false alarm or something. Idiots. Also, if someone is on a closed frequency, then clearly, yeah, shit's going down. You should send someone immediately to. And then, especially when you hear freaking gunshots, like those are on there. Yeah, you hear gunshots and they send one. Very out of shape cop to check it out. <laughs> Reginald. I want to know what happens to all those Twinkies he bought. Yeah, they fall out of his car when he like backs up. Oh, okay. Lunch. Well, that answered my my uh, my question. Thank you. But that part's good because they're like, "This is for emergencies only." He's like, "I'm not ordering a fucking pizza." <laughs> Which like he's yeah. probably pretty hungry. He probably has a pizza emergency too. Honestly, yeah. Can you imagine just running around like that all night? And he got so, he probably got so close to the little cocktail shrimp at the party. And then his, <laughs> like, he got pulled into his wife's office and he's like, no. It's like a wedding. If you're, you mean if you were the bride and groom where you yeah. can't actually get to eat? Basically, the bride of this movie. And I think Hans is the groom. Uh, Reginald, who is actually named Al, I don't, <laughs> Reginald is the name of the actor. He was also in Family Uncle Matters. Carl. I think what's his name in Family Matters. Isn't Uncle Carl from Fresh Prince? No, that's Uncle Phil. Okay, then... No, there was no uncle in Family Matters. He was the dad. Oh. I don't know. I just remember he was constantly annoyed with Steve Urkel. Well, wouldn't you be? He just keeps showing up and, like, creeping on your daughter. The show is horrible. But in this movie, his name is Al. But we're going to call him Reginald because that's what I wrote in the notes every time because it's a way better name. It's a really good name. If I got another cat, I would name it Reginald. And you could call him Reggie. Or just like Reg if you were feeling saucy. 
But then, then is it a gal? Because Reggie Rocket? It's multi-gender. It doesn't. It's fine. I dig I'm it. sure a cat won't mind. Um, he's getting snacks, though. And the like, gas station guy, like, says, I thought you guys only ate donuts. And then Reginald's like, they're for my wife. She's pregnant. He's like, yeah, okay. It turns out she is pregnant. Yeah, but I don't think the snacks are for her still. He's very clearly still working for, like, a long time. Yeah. Better buy all these Twinkies to go home in seven hours. I wonder when his shift ended, because he was, like, at Nakatomi Plaza for forever. Yeah, he was getting that time and a half pay, for sure. Um, So he gets sent to Nakatomi Tower, and he goes inside, and basically all the terrorists at this point are like, make sure, not all of them, Hans, the genius, is trying to get Bruce to not shoot for a little bit, just like tire him out, basically, so he doesn't alert Reginald, who's visiting, and they have the cowboy man pretending to be the desk guard, and he's, again, he method acted before he did this, so he was super convincing, and Reginald was like, okay, I'm very sorry to disrupt you, have a great night, and leaves, and then Bruce gets really pissed off and starts sh- shooting at the car to try to be like, hey, there's an actual problem. And he turns around and loses all of his Twinkies. No, Bruce doesn't shoot at the car. He gets attacked by the terrorists. He shoots the terrorists. And then he throws one of their fucking bodies out the window and it lands on the car. And it was honestly traumatizing and hilarious at the same time. I don't time. know how I didn't see that. But I, I saw him like shooting at, out the window. He does no, like- no, that's the terrorists. I think he so is. So Bruce though. did shoot the window so Thank he could you. break it enough to throw a body out. Of okay, it. so yeah. caught that part, didn't catch the body. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was a big part. Reginald gets in the car and then immediately a body just slams into the windshield. And he's like, what the fuck? And he's really good aim. Gunning it. Yeah, Bruce has really good body throwing aim. <laughs> But yeah, so then Reginald's like, hey, I think something might actually be happening. And then it cuts to Argyle again, still listening to the same song he was listening to before all of this death happened. Also, how the fuck was he having a conversation on the phone before with the volume that the music was at? He was trying to convince her he was like at a party and wanted her to think he was cool. Oh, man. That's actually a really good explanation. I know Argyle. We're of the same cloth. Lori, you got mad game. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Bruce kills you. another terrorist and he gets a detonator. I was very confused. Like the detonator is just what sets off the bomb. It's not the bomb itself. Yeah. It- yeah. Okay. Um, Bruce at this point gets like the walkie talkie and he starts talking to. Okay. His name is Bruce is the actor. John is the name of the character. And then at this point he tells the cop Reginald, who is actually Al, that his name is Roy. And there's also Alan Rickman is the actor who plays Hans. Yeah, but we call him Hans because he just like embodies it so well. <laughs> I just wanted to throw some more stuff in the mix there. Yeah, but don't confuse him with the actor Hans who plays one of the other terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> That's his name, one of the other terrorists. <laughs> Hans overhears that they're sending in cops and Bruce is like, no, don't do that. Like these guys are really trigger happy, even though I think at this point... No, they may have killed one more person than Bruce, but they're almost pretty even on the body count. I'm trying to... I think they've only killed three at this point. Oh, so they've got one on him. He'll catch up. (laughs) He does a really good job. At this point, also, the other police that have sent showed up with Reginald think that he's actually just talking to a terrorist on the phone, which is valid because they don't... Like, he's not an LAPD officer. He's just this random dude who's in this very random, unknowable situation. Yeah. Reginald trusts without knowing his actual name. Yeah, also, they never bring back the name Roy, like, ever. He just uses it once and then done. <laughs> but Roy doesn't come from nowhere. In the film, it's a part of his banter with Hans. Um, I think Hans, like, oh. refers to him as Roy Rogers at one point. Because Cowboy. Yeah, because Cowboy. All the cops start sending in a bunch of cops, like, pretty foolhardly. I Like, there's hostages you never just like well let's fucking go in and at one point when the fbi guys take over they're like we're probably only gonna lose like 20 percent of them but there's only like 20 people there so 20 percent of that many is a pretty significant amount of loss it's four people that's four lives that's a lot but yeah they send in like a swat truck and that gets blown up because they're idiots and then the fbi takes over and the fbi is like probably even worse than the cops 
Yeah. Although, so I want to say that Hans's um, discretion at killing people seems very arbitrary at times. Or yeah. it, it kind of seems, at this point, it, to me, it seems like he doesn't want to kill more people than he has to. Because he says, don't kill the cops, just injure them. Yeah. But then he also just shoots. Well. He probably knows that if you kill a cop, like, they're going to go hard trying to stop you. Maybe. But if you kill a hostage, like, the FBI is already cool with the hostages dying anyway, so. Yeah. The FBI people are, are also garbage. But I, I think another part of that story is that Hans has this plan for the timing to work out perfectly for him. So he's just trying to extend how long the cops are staying outside. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like the the FBI guys were really unnecessary. It was very... They were a strange comedic part of this movie because they were both named agent johnson yeah big johnson and little johnson <laughs> and they're just trigger happy and they love the violence and the action so they're I kind feel of like just they like... were taken directly out of the cast of point break like they were that kind of fbi agent <laughs> is that the one where keanu reeves yes surfing yes johnny utah i i think i had to watch part of that for my freshman year English class in college. I cannot imagine why sense. you would what? <laughs> I don't know why I'm thinking that, but it's they're sounds... just like they show you that movie and then they're like, no, all of that, no. <laughs> uh Argyle at this point his song is over, and so he turns on the news, and this is when he finds out that shit's going down and that his best friend bruce john is involved and then so he decides to do something and i'm not entirely sure how he helped but i think he ends up helping like i know he crashes into a vehicle and that's helpful but it's just funny i love how unnecessary he was he was my favorite part so the douchebag cocaine boy wants to negotiate a deal and he goes in with Hans and they pour him a nice Coca-Cola because they're like, oh, it's an American. So he starts pretending like he knows Bruce and Bruce is trying to be like, no, dude, I just met you. Don't do this. They're going to kill you. And they do. But then the cops overhear this and it gives them more fodder for like, oh, they just let him kill that guy. They're, he's definitely bad. Yeah. I do appreciate that Cokehead Douchebag doesn't name the, <clears throat> the wife. Yeah. It doesn't name the wife. Yeah, I kept waiting for him to do that. I was, was so stressed out. It was a surprisingly not uh, self-serving move on his part. I also just literally just like, kill him, kill him, please kill him. Like, I just wanted him to die so bad. Yeah. I wanted him to die hard. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where the name of the movie comes from. But we do get at this point in time that Hans does know John's real name is John. Now. Yeah, John McClane. He knows first name and last name. Mm-hmm. And I thought that that was going to be the point when he kind of somehow connected it or something, but he doesn't. And then at this point, Hans, the cops are talking to him and he's still trying to delay them. So he tells them that the terms of his hostage situation is releasing a bunch of people. And it seems legitimate until one of the other terrorists looks at him and is like, what? He's like, I read that name on the news. It'll take him forever to get into contact with them or something like that. Oh, yeah. The Asian Dawn terrorist Mm -hmm. group. Hans pretends to be oh so he's gone up to where Bruce is and he puts on his Hans puts on his very sweet American accent and pretends like he's a hostage and Bruce is trying to like figure him out and he asks what his name is and you see Bruce glance over at the list of people in the office and then Hans introduces himself as Bill Clay which is, is that what it, I th- I didn't know that it, that Bruce had glanced over the thing. I thought they were just showing us that no. that's where Hans Gruber got the name. No, because like Bruce looks over there. They show okay. his eyes. He does some eyebrow acting. Not as good as The Rock's eyebrow acting, but pretty good. Why does everyone have so many names? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, you don't have any pseudonyms or anything? Just like Fish Boy. That's, yeah. Why Fish Boy? I have a weird hole in my ear that I discovered is like a remnant of gills. What? Is it like below your ear? No, it's to everyone out there listening. I'm just oh. pointing to like above my ear hole slightly. And if you're, if you're a fish boy too, just know that you're not alone. It turns out Bruce knew that he was a bad boy all the time and stole his gun. Or he, there, he like had left his gun or something. There's no bullet, so Hans can't actually shoot him. But yeah. it's a very cute little 
first meeting for these two. Bruce tries to explain that, like, he doesn't know why he's here, that they accidentally invited him to this party. (laughs) (laughs) And I think he's handsome enough that Hans is like, yeah, I could see that. What? (laughs) What does handsomeness have to do with it? Because, like, if I was somewhere and I was just like, yeah, I don't know, I accidentally got invited to this party, they'd be like, no, you're lying. For him, they're like, yeah, we could see people wanting you at this party. You're handsome. (laughs) (laughs) Except he's dirty as fuck. But you can but he still doesn't be... have shoes on. <laughs> he's got no shoes on. He's just wearing a white beater. He would not have been invited to this classy Coke party. You can still tell somebody's handsome even if they're covered in garbage. That's the true lesson of this movie. <laughs> it's what's under the garbage that counts. <laughs> but only if they're handsome. The terrorists get into the vault, which I don't think they ever like explicitly said that was their goal this entire time until just now. And there's just like a bunch of art and shit in there. Well, the nerdy guy has been cutting away at the locks. Yeah, but you the- don't really know like to what end, right? I think we know that they are going to get tons of bonds. Yeah, he said it in the beginning to Nakatomi. Before I guess I was it. just surprised by how much random art there was in this building. Yeah, there was like a few Renoirs in there, I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. Nice. But yeah, well, the reason that they get into the thing is because Hans, super genius mega villain that he perfect. is, the perfect, the paragon of of crime, he knew that the FBI was going to cut the power to the whole area. So they cut the power and that opens up the safe. And he's like, just like I planned. Yep. He's great. He's amazing. The terrorists plan to blow up the whole building because they know once they go off with all this money, like there's no way that they're not just going to be haunted forever unless they think they're dead. Where were they going to hide in the building that they didn't also die in the blow up? I was imagining that somebody would come with a helicopter discreetly and save them, but I don't think that checks out. No. Maybe the van that the 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 nerdy guy was driving? Yeah, I think that was their getaway plan that Argyle foils, the hero of the film. Argyle, yeah. This is actually the story that's all about Argyle. I mean, like, literally Argyle, like, Bruce has to put in a lot of work for not very much payoff. Argyle's like, they don't have a getaway vehicle now, plan over. He also cold cocked that guy it was amazing just one fucking punch and that guy was unconscious argyle is scrappy as fuck argyle is the best <laughs> also that name is also very good well this is the point in the movie that i realized how evil hans was straight up because his plan was to get everyone all the hostages on the roof and let them blow up so that it looked like they were bodies that could have been their thieving team uh, so I guess that kind of throws out my theory that he was trying to kill as few people as needed. Like, well, no, he needed to, like, have enough alive up to that point, probably. Yeah, but if you're going to blow up the building, you could just kind of toss a dead body up there. And but then they'll have up. all the gun wounds. Uh, true, but if there's an expl- there's a different, I mean, like, a fire versus an explosion. How Only much- one way to know for sure. We got to test it. Yeah. <laughs> Or we go to Nakatomi Plaza in Los Angeles. It's actually a real building. It was being, it was under construction. So they got to use a few of the floors. Oh, that's really convenient. Yeah. There's like a really creepy part where all these news guys who are trying to get the scoop go into, they threatened the nanny with getting INS on her to let them into the house to talk to the children. And it reminded me pretty bleakly of right after shootings when all the news people swarm like schools or wherever it's happened to talk to people who just got out of the situation. It was just like the skeeviest, weirdest thing. Yeah, news people can be kind of garbage sometimes. And it, yeah, I, I would say that just particularly now too, that really resonates with the climate of intolerance yeah. for immigrants too. Like yeah. That particular tactic. Lori, you are supported again in thinking that this is a progressive and timeless movie. So on that note, there was a moment when um, Reginald slash Al talked about why he's no longer like an active duty cop. And it's because he accidentally shot a kid who had a toy gun. Yeah. I liked that they included it. I think it kind of goes along with the other stuff where... It was unnecessary. Like we could have, that could have not been in the movie, but I like that they included that because like he is really hesitant. He kind of wants to like see how the situation plays out before doing anything. And the other cops are like, really like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And like, you can tell that he had learned from that situation. He was really reflective on it. He wasn't defensive. He was like, I made a really big mistake. Yeah. It was good character development. 
I will say on the note of like stuff being relevant or not, um, the one part, so it was like a thing in the 80s, notoriously, there had to be tits, no matter what, even if it was completely irrelevant to the plot. Right. And it happens in stuff like Trading Places, Jamie Lee Curtis's character is just like, and now I'm getting undressed. And so in this movie, at one point, when Bruce is walking through a hallway, there's like a couple nudie calendars up and he pauses to look at them and the camera kind of focuses on them for a second. I was like, well, there it is. It almost got away with being like, the one 80s movie without random tits, but here we are. That wasn't even the only random tits. When they walk in on the two people where that you thought was a hotel room, but it's actually them <laughs> in the office, they show the woman's tits. That at least was it was contextual. Like they were doing stuff. Like it still could have done without it, but the one was just like, it's usually just like so random that you're just like this, why Why did you put that in there? There's no con- like reason. For yeah, that. and Bruce even like high fives one of the posters kind of, right? Yeah, yeah and he's like, girls, how you doing? <laughs> The hostages are on the roof and John goes up there to meet them and he starts asking where Holly is. And he's actually using her maiden name because he knows they all know her by that, which I thought was a cool touch. And he's trying to get them all off the roof and they're like, what are you talking about? This is how we're going to escape. And so then he just kind of like starts shooting around, like not at them, but kind of near them enough to where you're like, yeah, with guns, with bullets. (laughs) And so then the FBI guys who are in the helicopter at this point see that and start shooting at him. So it's a real confusing, almost comedy scene, but with bullets. Yeah. (laughs) 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 He gets like grazed with bullets. Oh, also at one point he pulls a giant shard of glass out of his feet. And like at the whole last half of the movie, it seems like he's about to bleed out from his feet. And I think this is... The only movie in the existence of ever where somebody's going to die by bleeding out via their feet. Uh, so there is. God. <laughs> there is also, so relevant another Bruce Willis movie where he's a hitman, and I can't remember. There was a sequel to it as well, but a guy's in a trunk. He's like the son of the Russian mafia. There's a shootout. He a bullet hits the trunk and hits him in the foot, and they like drive away in the car, not knowing that he's been shot in the foot. And and they stop an hour later, and he's bled out from being shot in the foot. Bland. Got Bruce Back Willis. Check, Lori. It's so damn. Yeah, no, that's so really cool. I'm excited because I was just that can't be a thing in many movies. Because like I think that should be a thing in more movies because it's really horrible. People <laughs> bleeding out from getting shot in the foot. It's so cool. Yeah, I feel like more people get shot in the foot than they ever show. Well, I feel like not because I feel like the foot would be harder to shoot than other parts of the body typically. Oh, it's the whole nine yards is the movie. Oh, and then the other ones are like 10 yards and stuff. I think I've seen that maybe. Yeah, I think maybe it's the whole 10 yards. Is, is the Matthew one Perry in that one? Yeah. Bruce Willis uses a fire hose as a bungee cord because he just has to look really cool. Yeah, it's not the first time that he's jerry-rigged an object that's not meant to suspend human weight. OSHA as... is not happy with him. Let's just say. No. Oh my God, no. He does not use a weight-appropriate harness. So this is the point where Hans actually blows up the roof. And the dick FBI guys blow up and there's just a bunch of explosions. Antony, did you write this part? Is this where you yeah. talk about? Okay, I was like, it does not sound like me. Many explosions, such boom. The roof blows up. The helicopter also blows up, but it doesn't completely blow up. It crashes into the building on a lower floor. That blows up. Bruce Willis has to dive and dodge all these explosions. And then the elevator door opens and there's another little explosion. <laughs> uh, Argyle drives into the bad guy's getaway van and he stops them, meaning that like he, that's all Bruce Willis had to do the whole time was just like, I mean, like uh, also he's, he had to save all the hostages. So that's pretty cool. But like, he I mean, put- Argyle's only dealing with one terrorist thief person at this point. He's only and- paid attention to what's happening for like 20, like if he were in that building, imagine what he could do. I mean, he cold cocked this guy with one hit. Yeah. Imagine if he did that to all the terrorists. <laughs> he just silently sneaks up on them one by one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bruce Willis had to fight that one guy for like a minute and a half. Our guy would do it just, there would be no fight. No, one and done. Yeah. Who hits? Me hitting you, you hitting the floor. Could they have, instead of Alien versus Predator, can we get a McLean versus Argyle? No, they wouldn't fight. I think they could. Argyle versus Predator would be pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Predator versus Alien versus Argyle. Versus Freddy Krueger versus Jason. Did they all get it on it? There was a Freddy versus Jason movie. Oh, I thought you were saying there's a Predator versus Freddy Krueger. No. I'd watch it, though. That would I be would. really cool. Does the Predator sleep? <laughs> John 
finds and confronts Hans. Hans has his wife who's being kind of just like chill about the whole thing, which is pretty cool. Um, John drops his gun. This is the part, though, where we get the amazing, iconic, great scene of Hans falling from the side of the building. Fun fact, the director pushed him down because he actually like, it was a stunt where he was falling for like 25 feet, but he had like cords on or whatever. And he said like, okay, we're going to push you on the count of three. And then he said one and then pushed him. So it's like legitimate death fear in Alan's eyes at this point. I don't normally like falling scenes in movies because they always <laughs> look a little shitty. They they always do it with the person like lying down on the ground doing like arms and legs flailing and it looks like shit. This one looked really good. I mean, Alan Rickman is perfection. So he died pretty, pretty. Well, no. I mean, we don't well, he, see him he, die. There could be, he could come back. He's dead. He fell from the 30th floor of a very tall building. He could have, like, there could be awning. <laughs> he landed on a bed of Twinkies. <laughs> Reginald saved him accidentally. So it seems like it's over, but then some bonus terrorists come out of the building and then Al just, like, shoots the shit out of him. He goes from, like, not being cool as shooting to very much being cool as shooting, like, immediately. Yeah, he, like, unloaded a full round into the guy. <laughs> That guy had a big fucking machine gun. And he just wouldn't go down. That guy, was he the one that John choked with a chain earlier? I think he was, so. yeah. yeah. Okay, so this motherfucker just won't die. You gotta try hard to get him to die hard. <laughs> Holly gets to punch the creepy reporter guy, and that was very satisfying. Yeah, that I guy is her. such a piece of shit, and I hate and love simultaneously that he got that final line. Of turning to the camera and be like, did you get that? But that's like just even more like how decrepit his morality is. I would have really liked it if she, just like Argyle, cold cocked that guy. Just one day. <laughs> she, she knows Argyle <laughs> somehow already. And like, it turns out he's just like her secret security guard this whole time. <laughs> uh, and then John and Holly get in Argyle's limo and drive away into the sunset. Well, so in the limo, they're kissing each other right it's looking good for a team i mean it's just a silhouette so we're not sure who's kissing who but it, you can definitely infer that it's bruce and holly i feel like bruce, bruce and Argyle Ralph does messy aggressive kissing in a lot of his movies it's i'm uncomfortable watching him kiss i'm uncomfortable watching him do a lot of things to be honest particularly pulling glass out of his feet oh yeah yeah it, it is worse that he's like gross and bloody <laughs> At he's this point, so too. Funny. and he's <laughs> aggressively kissing her. <laughs> he has so many people's blood on him. He should probably go to a hospital. Probably, he he's been it. shot. He's had glass. He's bleeding out of his feet, still, isn't he? Do they ever like fix that, or does he just like get in the car and go? Well, no. He takes his dirty ass wife beater that's covered in sweat and grime, and also other people's blood, and he wraps it around his foot, and that's how he ends up shirtless because it's an action movie. So, well, yeah, but like, I feel like that's not gonna. If you're like bleeding out to the point where you're getting woozy, and there's that whole scene where he's like, Reginald, tell my wife I love her, and Reginald's like, No, man, you do it. You're not just gonna be like, Oh my shirts on it now i'm fine what would you guys say you learned from die hard shit what was the lesson that you said earlier it was a really good one yeah it was you should repeat it i don't know it doesn't matter the oh. shoe <laughs> but the foot that's in it and how you can get that foot out of the shoe for some reason it took bruce willis almost losing his feet and killing nine people to realize that he needed to apologize to his wife but yeah. that that lesson that you should apologize more is a good one yeah you should be supportive of your partner yeah i learned that oh i learned that if <laughs> terrorists show up somewhere you should prioritize shoes to holster yes well, like but even then like he could have grabbed his shoes and the holster he didn't need to put his shoes on right then and there so that was just just always grab shoes i think shoes are difficult to carry if you're in a rush Mm, but I, like he almost died because of his feet so shoes are worth it yeah but by the end of the film since he had his shoes off so long he was probably like super chill after that flight extra <laughs> chill oh my god he's never gonna have to do that that carpet grabbing exercise again it's just it's, it's set for life what would you guys rate this i would give it i'm gonna say an eight out of ten good one-liners good action uh alan rickman I would 
agree with eight out of ten, but I'm gonna give it a bonus point, bump it up to nine, Ooh. just because watching it does seem to be a little bit cliche, but I think this movie was way more unique in its time than I realize now. So probably going to give it a 10 because I can't think of what should be taken out or changed really to make it better. Huh? More Argyle would be good though. Is it a Christmas movie and a one sentence explanation? Andoni? I, Ooh, there was Christmas music in boom esque Christmas music throughout the whole movie. They were, there was like very deep horns <laughs> playing in the background. So I think if you've got Christmas music throughout the whole movie, your Christmas movie. I agree. I would consider it an action movie before labeling it a Christmas movie, but I think it's both for sure. I'm going to say that technically it's probably not because I think true Christmas movies like can't take place any other time of the year and still work. And I think Die Hard could happen at like any other holiday or no holiday and like very little would have to change and like overall the movie would still be the same. But I personally count it as a Christmas movie because it's a fun movie to watch during Christmas time because everything else is so like Love Actually or to Grandmother's House We Go and stuff like it's so sweet and this one's just like so not that that is cool to count as one. I've also thought about it all day because I knew I was going to ask that question. <laughs> If you were to choose who's more handsome, Hans Gruber or John McClane, get in contact and let us know. Also, let us know if you think it's a Christmas music movie or not. How was the Christmas music? Let us know if it's a Christmas movie or not. Get in t- contact with us at pottingthistogether at gmail.com or on all social media. Because I can't remember any of our, our usernames. Okay. That's fine. Thanks for coming on again, Luke. Yeah, thanks, guys. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. I don't know. Oh, leave meeting. For real, bye.